Kim, welcome to the Automation Solution Podcast. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, you're very welcome. So I did like a little bit of a, an intro for everybody so they have an idea of your background. But I, I would like, if you don't mind, let, can you help, help us just kind of step through your career a little bit and why you, know, you are really one of the experts in client engagement, which is a big part of this discussion. So if you could just share a little bit about yourself with our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So my, my name is Kim Kalp and I started a company about nine years ago now called the Super Fan Company, which has been an amazing, wild adventure. We focus on fan engagement and making sure that brands and sports teams and music artists and movies are resonating with their fans. And whether that you call them fans or customers or guests or clients, they come by many names. Right, but, right. but the main thing is how do, you, how do you make people feel appreciated? How do you make them feel connected and loved? with your with your brand or your entity and so we've been working hard at that for the last nine years before that in my previous life i worked in events and marketing at conde nast which is a big publishing arm out in uh, new york city mm -hmm. and really it was then in 2011 when the company started that we were seeing a rise in social media we were seeing a rise in consumption practices and how people got information and i always like to take people back to 2011 put them in a okay. little time machine that remember in 2011 we were uh, downloading songs for 99 cents off iTunes. We were listening to Pandora. That was sort of the latest cool streaming device. And we were on Facebook. Right. No such thing as Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat or Spotify or um, HBO Go or Net, you know, all of these things that we now have to consume and connect did not exist in 2011. So we really saw that wave coming, saw that tsunami coming and thought about how do we further engage people in new and exciting ways, especially around events or tentpole practices. Right. So then, so step me through then um, the, the business model that you used, obviously you were a visionary. And you put this business model together and how did it get off the ground? It's interesting. I think, you know, when anyone starts a business, yes, it's a great idea. And there's lots of businesses that have great ideas, but it's also about timing. You know, you can have an amazing business idea that's just, it's not the right time. Right. And so we got really lucky that it was the right idea at the right time and sort of blended together to form this, this perfect moment. And we continue to see that. And I always say it feels like I start a new company every single year because as things change, you're constantly adapting, you're constantly pivoting, you're constantly changing. I think any company that's not doing that is becoming stale you know I sort of use the phrase constant beta you're constantly in beta you're constantly trying new new techniques I think we're gonna see a lot of that right now in 2020 sure. because companies I that sort of fall victim to the well that's the way we've always done it you know well we've always just sort of rinse washed and repeat that was always sort of kind of a not a best practice but I think a especially now, it's just flat out not going to work. So it went from a maybe not a best practice to that's not working at all. And we're going to have to change and we're going to have to innovate. We're going to have to think of new ways to do things. And so that's really where we've stepped up even more and said, let's guide people through this change. Let's right. rethink this consumer engagement, this fan engagement, this client engagement, and what does that look like under these new circumstances? So that is what we've been diving headfirst into and what's been keeping us very busy since March. So that's that's awesome. And that's a big part of this conversation because I will tell you the the listeners that we have and, and men and women that have been in like automation or manufacturing, large and small companies are used to the um, very traditional year after year, same marketing plan. They may make small tweaks, but overall it's always, you know, we're going to throw a million dollars at a trade show. We're going to have networking events. We're going to, you know, go to all of these um, uh, events across the globe to make sure that everybody sees our machines and sees the products that we have. And, and 
the, those days, as of right now, that's not going to happen. I mean, most of them have been, have been canceled already in the spring, and there are several that we go to in the fall that are, you know, could be 100,000 people that attend. It's not going to happen. There's just no way. So before we kind of dive into that, I just, just to give everybody just a little bit of a credibility to with you, can you give us some of the customers, like the brands that you've worked with before? Because I think that's going to tie into, you know, where we kind of go from here. Absolutely. So we do a lot in the entertainment space. So everybody from the, the music artists and the bands that you know and love, whether that's Paul McCartney and Bob Dylan, or that's Taylor Swift and Katy Perry. We've, we've worked with all of them. I joke that it can be young like Kids Bop, or we've worked with people that have passed away like Johnny Cash. Right. You know, it, it runs the gamut, young, old, pop, rock, uh, because all of those people have fans and they have right. super fans and people that they want to engage. So we've done a lot with individuals in the music space. We've done a lot with music festivals, Stagecoach, which is a big country music festival that happens every year. We do a lot in that space, do a lot with sports teams. We've worked with the New York Mets for five years, the Boston Red Sox. Again, perfect examples of entities that have tons of fans and tons of super fans. And then also brands and conglomerates like Comic-Con, who we've worked with the past couple of Ace Comic-Cons in the past couple of years. Uh, in March, we finished out a huge tour with Oprah. Awesome. So all things Oprah, which is just a fun fact, which is the most recognizable person and figure around the world. They did a big uh, test about a year ago with everybody from the Dalai Lama to Warren Buffett and Oprah around the world was the most recognized figure. So worked with Oprah on a big tour that she did and that was really fun and exciting. So our experience really runs the gamut. We've also worked with brands like American Express and Amazon. So at the end of the day, I always tell people, you have super fans, whether you know it or not, right. you cannot address it. And that super fans come in all shapes and sizes. I tell people all the time, if you say, oh, I'm not a super fan of anything or, oh, you know, I don't like anything. I would love to hear you talk about what coffee you have to drink. Cause I have friends who say, if it's not a, I only drink Starbucks, right? If it's not Starbucks. I don't drink it. Or I have friends who say, I only fly Delta. I need all my points, I only fly Delta, or I only stay at Marriott hotels, or I only, you know, my mom's spaghetti is the best spaghetti. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, you are a super fan of something, whether you know it or not. And so right. on the flip side, I think it's important for companies and brands to remember that they have super fans, whether they want to address them or not. And so how do you talk to these people? How do you introduce your new product or your new initiative to them, it's extremely important. And it's something you have to start paying attention to now more than ever before, probably. Yeah. And that's a, that's an awesome point that I'm going to just touch on because the companies, you know, in our industry, it's obviously not as sexy as, as musicians, <laughs> entertain entertainers. And, but still we all do have super fans and we work with, you know, our probably number one robotic company is called Fanic. And they're, you know, really one of the world's largest robotic companies. And, and we're a super fan. Now, whether they know that or not is, you know, is different. And they're a company that would go to a trade show typically, spend a lot of money, have displays, interact, which is all great. And then there's other companies that are smaller that might provide like conveyors in a factory. And, but there's different kinds and, and we all like certain brands and we're fans. So I think for the listeners it's important for them to really understand what you just said. That doesn't matter the type of business you're in. You do have fans and they can, I'm assuming if, if you develop the right strategy, you can even go deeper with those customers or clients or fans and grow business and potentially attract new business through word of mouth. And so that's where I think we need to probably dive in Kim and spend some time is, is I want the listeners to come away with some ideas potentially of some things that might be completely out of the box because, because again, everybody's very traditional, stuck in their own ways. Typically they're not thinking maybe the way that you think they're not as creative as the super fan company and what you've put together. 
so let me frame it. Let me just start kind of and give you an idea of the type of relationship and how it can be formed through the traditional channel of the, of the methods. And then maybe you, you and I can just talk about different ideas and what we could, this customer could potentially do. So let's take a, a customer like Kraft Foods, right? We all know Kraft, big brand, um, phenomenal company, very successful. So Kraft has multiple factories across the globe, always looking to innovate, automate, just like every other uh, manufacturing plant would. They typically would send several representatives potentially to a trade show and they walk these large trade shows and they're looking at the newest and greatest machines and um, conveyors, robots. Uh, there's all kinds of new technology coming out. And then people like myself or other suppliers or vendors are spending the money to try to attract this customer, right? We want more of the crafts and we want all that business we can have. Well, we just talked about that that's gone this year, right? It's not going to happen. And hopefully some of it comes back in 2021. But what are some strategies that others could implement to still let a company like Kraft know about their product or something new they've come out with and how it can help them through all the noise because there's tons of noise in email um, how do you get to the right person like what type of strategies could we come up with that would help you know a lot of us in this industry absolutely and i think you know to me as i as i think about that situation in that scenario i always i love to use analogies because i think it kind sure. of helps people understand so I always tell people imagine yourself if you don't have kids you know ask somebody with kids because they'll completely understand this put yourself around any two or three year old and you will constantly hear why you know we have to get yep. in the car why it's nap time why I, you have to eat that vegetable why <laughs> you know and you try to give answers and then it usually ends up because mommy or daddy said so and you're, right. you're so yeah. annoyed <laughs> um, but I think it's an important thing to, to, to kind of think about that. And so to go through that scenario, okay, you're, you're at a trade show. Why are you at the trade show? Well, you're at the trade show because you want people like these craft workers to see your brand. Why? Because if they see your brand, then they might consider you as a resource for them. Why? Because they have a need that you think that you can fill. Right. Why, why be at that specific trade show? Well, you think that specific trade show has the people that you have deemed worthy of hearing your message and your customer. Great. Why, why spend all the money to show up to the trade show? Well, because we want to be the flashiest and we want to present the, our best foot forward and we want to show all of this great work that we've been doing. Again, because you want to create that connection with that buyer or create that intrigue, if you will. So right. sort of the, the movie trailer effect of, huh, this seems interesting. Maybe I'll watch the rest of this movie. Maybe I'll learn more about this company. And so to me, when I, when I hear trade show or when I hear conference, to me, I think of movie trailer. It's a movie trailer effect. And how do we have that movie trailer effect anywhere because the truth of the matter is you can make people intrigued with your brand or your company or your product or your service wherever you are it's just how you go about doing that so it's really about getting in the mindset of saying how can we intrigue people right you can intrigue people with maybe what you're doing digitally you can intrigue people with things that you physically send i i keep telling people and drilling into people i think people have forgotten about direct mail. I think people have looked at it as old school or, or for a while we went pure experiential, you know, which is important. How do I get this on Instagram? Or, right. you know, I have the prettiest displays for people to take pictures in front of. And I think that's great. And I've always said that there, do not lose the lost art form of direct mail because I think it's super important. And I think obviously now more than ever when so many people may or may not be confined to their homes, Direct mail is their only link to the, to the outside world, safe link that is. And I think it's really important because that's a piece that's coming into their home. Right. And if you make something that's going to be useful and used and kept 
that's going to be a huge win. So that's something that we've been really focused on with clients and really honing in to say, how can you take something from a trade show, from a conference and, and deduce that down into something that can be emailed or that can be sent in direct mail and still make it impactful and still get that person intrigued on what you're offering. Right. No, that's, that's awesome. So correct me if I'm wrong, but so an, an idea would be, let's say you have this machine that you're trying to sell to, to multiple large fortune 500 companies because it, it works in manufacturing um, for most applications. I would, I would think that like video coming up with a clever, catchy, short video to get in front of people through social media or direct targeted email campaigns or LinkedIn or whatever that might be, could be one possibility. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. So doing something unique with video and then even coming up with maybe a model. Um, so I'm thinking of like model cars, but spending the money and coming up with, yeah, something like, so Fanic, who's our robotics company, this, these are things that they, they give you, right? So people, customers will set this on their desk and it's there and it's kind of cool. And it, it, you know, I look at it every single day, probably don't think a lot about it, but when the time comes to when we're making purchases, you know, this is, this is in my office, right? Yeah. And now other companies do it, but is that another way of maybe, you know, engaging? Absolutely. And I think it's also creating things that are, I, I joke, it's either useful or it's fun, right. you know, it's useful. I'm going to use it. It's practical or exactly what you just held up and showed. It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. And I want to keep it on my desk and it brings a smile to my face and I love it. So for instance, let's say you have a machine that is a cooling agent or it right. somehow cools something or uh, maybe the boxes that it produced, you know, seals them in so, some right. sort of cool process. Um, I think an, an example of a useful gift might be coming up with some fun packaging that, that we could do. And then one of those fans that plugs into your phone. Right. And again, now that the summer months are coming up, you know, people are going to be out and about, maybe taking walks around their neighborhood a useful fan on their phone is fun. And it also speaks to something that your machine is doing, which is, you know, this cooling process. Right. So something that also triggers, um, triggers a connection back yeah. to what you're doing, I think is super important, but th you know, that's one example, but I think that's the type of thinking that we sit down and do with clients of saying, how do we create an experience or something that also when people ask them, oh, what a cool fan, you know, that's attached to their phone. Again, it's reminding them of your company and really it's showing off at the end of the day, whether you're at a trade show or a conference, what you're really showing off and what a lot of that is, is how innovative you are. Right. You know, anyone can put a 10 by, you know, 10 by 10 plain desk with like a sad white, you know, tablecloth with some or free, pen and, you know, yeah. free pens and like a plant. At the end of the day, you're going to walk right past that booth at the trade show and you're going to go on to the booth that has, you know, laser lights and a spinning wheel that lights up and, you know, you're going, oh my God, what a, what a cool booth. Like, what is this? What do these right. people do? And you're, you're creating that intrigue. And really, you want the people for the rest of the day to say, man, did you check out that booth at the back? Holy cow, that was awesome. I don't even have a need for a XYZ machine. But man, what those guys did, that was smart. And what, those, what that does is that creates people that are natural brand advocates. Right. You've created super fans who are now going around for the rest of the day or the rest of the weekend saying, man, I know that you don't need an X, Y, Z, but you got to check out that booth. And what's going to happen is that word of mouth is going to continue. And what's so great about it is then people have your company name or your product or your brand in their mind. And when they go back to the office or when they go back into their everyday life and something pops up, a friend talks to them, a colleague calls, they're going to go, you know what? I didn't find a need for it. But now that you say that, there was this brand last month that I saw at a trade show that you should totally check out. Right. And that's free sales. 
that is free everlasting sales that you will have for the rest of time all because you had you know laser light shows <laughs> at your booth right and so what i tell people is you can have that same effect at home or or in somebody's office the exact example you just showed i'm sure you've had countless people come into your office who say hey what's that what's right. that little yellow oh, yeah. thing you have back there and you get it out and you show them and again they might not be customers of that product but they say hey that's really cool like what a cool thing and then for the rest of the day you know in their mind they they have that you've sold that person on a product or company that you may or may not even work with or work for and so that to me is like the ultimate win that's the ultimate right. win and and it's creating those super fans, whether you know it or not, or, or client advocates or brand advocates. Again, they come by a lot of different names, but it, it, the core, it's all the same. Yeah, no. Awesome. I love it. And what do you say to the people that will say, oh, it's, it's risky. I don't want to look, I don't want to look like we're, we're stupid. We don't know what we're doing. I don't want to, we've never done it before. It'll, it won't work. It doesn't fit our industry. It fits this industry, but you know, you, there's all these people that will literally come up with 10 excuses in their head and just kill the concept from even being talked about further. So what do you tell those people that are stuck? You know, they're stuck in their old ways. Two things. One, change is always scary. I know it's always scary. It's never not going to be scary. It's like jumping into a cool, cold pool. The pool is cold. I can tell you to dip your toes in and kind of get in slowly. You can cannonball, you can belly flop. It's cold. Whatever way you choose to get in, it's cold. So, you know, I, I totally sympathize with, with doing something out of your comfort zone. It's always going to be a little scary, no matter what way you decide to dive in. However, uh, the second point is obviously change is always good to try. I think it's, especially now with COVID-19, people are going to have to think outside of the box, unfortunately, because now they are forced to. Right. In the first example, it would be like, well, you know, you don't have, one choice is you don't get into the pool at all. And, you know, you just sit safely on the sidelines and you watch the people that got into the pool. But now in this, in, <laughs> during COVID-19, you're getting shoved in. <laughs> so right. yeah. You're getting shoved into the pool. So you can shove yourself in gracefully, you know, a, a beautiful dive, or you can struggle and resist. You're going to get pushed in anyways, but keep struggling, keep resisting. And then ultimately, you know, you'll belly flop. Right. So I think, you know, COVID-19 has caused every company in every industry, no matter what you're in, to change and, and, and change their tactics, quite frankly frankly. Yeah. And that part is where I think we have discovered a new opportunity. So if you're at one of these companies, you know, I talk to a lot of people who say, Kim, I've been trying, uh, you know, you wouldn't believe it. I've told my boss 10 ways from Sunday for the last year, you know, that we should be zigging, but all that he or she wants to do is zag. They only want to zag and they keep I bring them ideas to zig. I bring them ideas to zig and they just, they shut me down all the time. They shut me down. And I say, great, well, let's turn some lemons into lemonade because COVID-19 has brought you a gift, which is your boss has to look at the zig. Right. He or she might've been ignoring it. Oh, we can put it off, but you know what? Their zag methods aren't going to work now. So they, they got to look to zig and, and I won't name names, but, we got contacted yesterday by a, a large, large, large sports team. And uh, the person who contacted us was at the assistant level, which we thought was kind of surprising. Yeah. And when we got on the phone, he said that they did an all hands meeting with all 200 some on people that work at this organization. And their CEO said, I don't care if you are an assistant, if you are an intern, if you are a C level, I need ideas. So this is a CEO saying, yeah, we are in a we are in a new world. I need ideas, and I don't care where they come from. And I think that that's just one example that that we saw yesterday. But I think companies across the board, no matter what field you work in, you're going to start to see from the top down people saying, "Man, we we got to figure this out. 
we need ideas. And so I think if you're one of those people that have been saying, man, I've been, I've been trying for months or I've been trying for years, you know, th this is your moment. This might be a, a great opportunity for you. Now that, that example from yesterday, what a, what a great leader to come out with that message and cascade that down to really every level, right? Mm -hmm. In the organization to bring ideas. There's still going to be people, because I saw it after the Great Recession, where people put their head in the sand and they just thought that this would all work itself out, right? So yeah. COVID-19 is going to go away. Things will get better next year and it'll go back to exactly what it was like in February. And so there's going to be a large percentage of companies in, in all industries that do nothing, no matter how many times they talk to people like you or me or somebody else, they're not going to do anything. They're just, they truly believe that it's going to come back to the norm where it was before. What do you think is going to happen to those types of companies? Just your gut, just your gut. I mean, I know it's tough right now. We're all living in this unprecedented time, but what do you think is going to happen? Uh, quite frankly, I think those companies will become extinct. I just don't think that they're going to work. So, so here's an example I'll give you of, of that. Let's say you were a company that you marketed products that people take on vacation back in 1999. Okay. Vacation products. Right. Great. You know, little, little cute dock kits for men, the shavers. Okay. You take it traveling. Um, you know, deodorants, all that sort of thing. And then 9-11 hits. And you think, well, things will go back to normal. I can keep my travel business with my shampoos and my conditioners, you know, and my razors and my scissors and my, you know, no problem. Yeah. This, will, this will all go back to normal. This whole 9-11 thing, I don't have to worry about that. Then the TSA comes out with changes. Then how we travel completely changes. Then it's three ounce bottles. Then it's no scissors. Then it's no certain types of shavers. If you didn't change your business, <laughs> right. you would have no customers <laughs> because if they right. chose to buy your product and tried to bring it on a plane, um, they'd be told to throw it in a trash can or knock it on the plane. Right. And so it, it's a very stark example, but I use it because people, when they talk about travel, um, you know, my parents, for, for example, will say, well, back in the day, you could smoke on planes. <laughs> yep. Well, back on the day, back in the day, we used to dress up, you know, Pan Am, you used to wear a suit and tie to sure. get on a plane. And that was that generation. And my generation, sadly, was, well, pre 9-11, you didn't have to take off your shoes. Right. And pre 9-11, we didn't have to go through the, the scanners, the, the body scanners. And now that's just become a new normal. And so I think, yes, things will go back to normal. Did we all fly after 9-11? Of course. Did we all get back on planes? Of, of course we did. If anything, more airlines came out and more services were introduced. So we, right. we came back stronger than ever. But it was different. It, it was it, it was never the same and it will probably never be the same ever. And so I think with coronavirus here in the US, yes, things will go back to, to a new normal and but will it ever be the same as, as what it was before? I don't think so. And yeah. we'll come back and it'll be better than ever and new innovations will come out and we'll come back strong, but it won't be exactly the same. So I think to, to treat your company exactly the same it's going to be detrimental, definitely in the short run, but for the long run as well. It just, it, it simply won't work. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome example of, you know, the, the pre 9-11, the, that product you were talking about, um, you know, if the company didn't change, probably no longer in business. Do you have an example, you know, looking back at your career of a company that faced maybe, you don't need to name names, but a company that faced similar challenges and they however did innovate did take risk did make changes and came out the other end ultra successful you know i was talking to someone about this the other day i actually think the soda brands have done a remarkable job of this i think in the last 10 years you saw a lot of health and wellness content being put out don't give your kids soda 
I can't, you know, no sugars, right. sugar free. And what the sodas companies did, which I think was, you know, PepsiCo and Coca-Cola being great examples, they went and said, okay, we're not going to get rid of Coke. We know that. But man, do we need to diversify our portfolio? Because this right. health stuff isn't going away. And we can't keep putting out commercials saying, no, you can definitely give your three-year-old Coca-Cola, no <laughs> problem, you know, because that, that also won't work. Right. So they had their M&A departments and their entrepreneurial departments go on a buying spree. And you've seen the purchase of Hint Water, and you've mm -hmm. seen the purchase of Vitamin Water, and you've seen the purchase of Vita Coco, and you've seen a lot of beverage companies get bought. And the genius part is, is that Coca-Cola and PepsiCo do not rebrand these initiatives. So you can continue to go out and buy Hint Water. You can go right. out and continue to buy Vitamin Water, having no idea that Coca-Cola owns them. I think now Vitamin Water has a small thing on the back that says like, part of the Coca-Cola family. Right. Maybe. But they didn't rebrand Coke and say, well, we're going to make, um, you know, coconut Coca-Cola. Right. No. They yeah. just went out and bought Vita Coco and said that that will be one of our brands. And so what I think you're also going to see is a lot of people consolidating and saying, we're, we're not going to fight this, but sort of, I call it the Avengers model of, you know, we're going to take Captain America and we're going to take the Hulk and we're going to put them together. <laughs> you right. know, yeah. We're, we're no, going to, we're going to find companies or we're going to find organizations that we can marry together and sort of the synergy be greater than the whole. So I think you're going to see a lot more collaboration. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more companies coming together to say, how can we all solve this? How can we all come together and, and figure this out? But I actually think you know, the beverage space has done a remarkable job in the last 10 years of saying, we have got to find a better way and we have to yeah. innovate in new ways. No, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. I've never, you know, I haven't thought about that, the Coke and Pepsi strategy, but it has worked well. And you're right. They're just, they're continually looking for ways to not allow them to become obsolete with all the changes in health and wellness that's going on. So that's, that, that's awesome. So really the, the takeaway for, I think, the listeners, you know, a couple things that really resonated with me, Kim, is that if you don't change, you're in trouble. I mean, just, just plain and simple, right? It's not going to be like it was. The, the new normal will be different. We, none of us really know what that means yet, but we're starting to see a little bit of um, sampling ideas across the globe of what it could look like. So now spending time with your team, brainstorming, engaging, um, you know, companies like yours, trying to come up with new ways of how we're going to market our business. I think that is, is rule number one. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to spend time thinking about how you can innovate and how you can change to make sure you're still here for the long haul. Um, that's number one. And then number two is that you have to take risks. No matter what, it's going to be scary. Your analogy of the pool I thought was great. Everybody's getting pushed into the pool. So fight it or swim or look elegant, whatever it is that you want to do. But that has to happen. And then I think the other thing for me that I really took away is to maybe look at your current product offering or current product line. Go back to and, and do some study and do some analytics on who bought what? Why did they buy those products? What was it for? What was their why, right? What was the why? Make sure you can really tie that that why is still going to exist. Mm -hmm. And then if it is, find a new way to market that. Honestly, it should be more cost effective because going to these events and traveling and spending all the money on hotel and air and conferences and trade shows cost a fortune. And then they need to look at investing that money a little bit differently, right? To come up with the, hopefully the same solution. And then if you're doing something now today or you're providing a service or a product that might be affected from the COVID-19, take a hard look at it. I mean, it's, don't fight it. I mean, I think if people that will fight where they want to be based off of what's happened in the past could end up being a losing proposition it, just because things, I think I know, I know people really love what they've done, love what they've created some people have spent their entire careers and it's all of a sudden, bam, the door was shut on them. 
you know, just overnight. And it's going to be really hard for those folks. But I think spending the time and, and working with companies like yourselves or talking with peers, suppliers, vendors, all coming together is, is another real takeaway that I, that I heard from you today. Absolutely. And I would also say, you know, one thing about change that I hear a lot is people also are worried it's going to be expensive. You know, right. oh my gosh, oh, to come up with a whole different thing, it's going to, it's going to be so much. And I think, you know, that's something that, you know, even myself as a small business owner, I'm, I'm keenly aware of because people will say, well, Kim, why don't you do X, Y, Z? And I say, do you know how much that's just going to, that's going to cost for me right. to do X, Y, Z? And so, you know, again, going back to that Avengers model that, that I love so much, it's about finding a, a person or an entity or a company that can come in and offer that sort of service on an a la carte basis. So, you know, for us with our clients, we always come in and, and say, we're going to be a second set of hands. You know, we're going to help you on this specific project. This is how it's going to work. We're going to be an accentuation of your, you know, marketing team, or we're going to help you have figure this out and then we'll be gone. You know, right. so sometimes people are scared that, oh man, if I were to try to do this thing, I'd have to hire someone. I can't do it. I might have to hire two people. You know, I can't do this all myself. We hear that a lot. People are overworked, right. you know, God, that's a great idea, but you know, head scratch, I can't do that all myself. And God, would I have to hire an assistant or, or hire another person? And then you're thinking about, man, health insurance and 401k and hiring people, where would I find them? And, you know, all that, that spiral of questions. And we say, no, we're going to come in. We're going to come in. We're going to help you for a month, two months, three months, whatever. And then wipe your hands, boom, we're gone. So, you know, find companies that will work with you, whether it's on a project basis or a retainer basis, short-term retainers. We've done retainers that are 30 days, you know, because again, I'm a big believer in, find out where you can pitch in, find out where you can help and then, you know, pivot and, and keep going. And I think that's also important, you know, something to keep in mind that as you're talking to people in your organization or as you're, you know, potentially throwing out ideas, you know, to sort of cut it off in the head and say, this doesn't have to be a huge expense. This right. doesn't have to be a huge overhead. This doesn't have to be a huge time suck. It can certainly, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, that's a great point. So tying that, that piece together, how can companies measure um, you know, some of these efforts? Let's say they take the risk, they come up with a great idea, they, they implement something. It's really difficult sometimes, right, to measure, did it work? Did I get, a new, did I get new business? Did I keep a customer that I was about ready to lose? How, how do you help people or what do you tell them is the best way to try to measure these, these new initiatives? You know, it's really funny. I have so many, whether they're CFOs or logistics people that completely hate me for this answer. <laughs> they hate it. And, and I know because, you know, they're very one plus one equals two. We had one orange. We have two oranges. Okay. Right. Um, you know, E11 in my spreadsheet, everything is very, and I think that that's why they love digital so much because they know that they can spend $20 on Facebook and exactly 77 people saw it. And you know, that number feels very safe to them. What they don't realize is, you know, how many of those 77 people just had it on the background and were paying attention to it. You know, so, so there's lots of room for error. And I think at the end of the day, when you're when you're talking about initiatives, a lot of time the answer is you don't know. And nobody likes that. Right. Nobody likes the, I don't like it, <laughs> you know, nobody likes it, but you know, the truth of the matter is you sometimes you don't know and you do it anyways. I right. think, you know, the example I always give people is the Goodyear blimp. Can you measure how many people know about the Goodyear blimp or saw the Goodyear blimp? No, no. but you know what no. happens during every major event, whether it's the Super Bowl or whatever, what do you think they hoist up in the air? the Goodyear blimp. And every yeah. time people see that blimp, they say Goodyear blimp. How many people saw it? Well, there were 90,000 people around the stadium, but then people could also see it from their cars. Do we count the car people or do we not? And do we count the people that put the Goodyear blimp on their social media? Do those people count that saw the Goodyear blimp? It's like, yeah. 
you know, so but Goodyear sees the expense on their P and L and says, I I don't know how much the Goodyear blimp costs, but let let's say it costs half a million dollars. You know, yeah, there's someone in that room going, well, is that a good use of half a million dollars? <laughs> how many people really? And it's like, you don't know. I, right. I don't know how many people are going to see the Goodyear blimp, but yeah. you know what? It's going out, and people are going to remember it. And to this day, I mean, I've never seen another blimp that's not Goodyear. Right. I don't even own a car. I live in New York City and I know the Goodyear blimp. Right. So, you know, that's the type of example that the answer is, the answer might be, you just don't know, but yeah. it's still worth it. It doesn't I, make it not worth it. No, I agree. And I would challenge those, the, the people that think that way to even go back to the, the money they spend at a trade show. And six months later, tell me, so what revenue did you get from the trade show? And they will look at you with this, you know, blind stare. They have no idea. They have no idea. They said they've got, you know, 300 people. They scan their badge and you hope that sales and marketing put them into a CRM and maybe they're getting newsletters or updates, but you really don't know. So I think it is, to your point, it's really hard to measure any of that, but you, you really still have know, to do and, it. And you really don't know, you know, I, I use this example because I think it's so powerful that if they're you know, your example of you get 300 people that they scan their badge, right? All it takes is one person. And if one out of those 300 people was like, that was the coolest booth, those laser lights and that glow in the dark monkey that they had set up was the coolest thing I've ever seen. And that one person flies back to their hometown and puts that in their newsletter that right. their company newsletter goes out to called a thousand people and that person is still so obsessed that you know what they talk about it on a podcast they talk about it on two podcasts three podcasts four podcasts and each one of those podcasts touches another thousand people right and then they love it so much that they put it on their own social media and they have a thousand followers that one person just got your message to six thousand more people because yeah. you impressed one person so yes, that person could go back to their CFO and the CFO could go, well, we only touched 300 people. I don't think that was a good use of the glow in the dark monkey. <laughs> yeah, but you know what you'll never be able to track is that one person who then got it out to 6,000 people. That's so, true. So yes, the glow in the dark monkey was worth it. So, yeah. you know, that's the sort of stuff that I think you just have to you know, innovate? Did Steve Jobs know that the iPhone was going to become what it is now? I don't think he had any idea. Right. But, you know, sometimes with innovation, you just have to try things not knowing what the outcome is going to be. No, I love it. That's awesome. Very, very cool. So my hope, Kim, is that the, the listeners really, this to me has been a great podcast. A lot of phenomenal ideas have come out. Something that people can go back to, listen, watch the video, what I would like, I'm going to put you on the spot. What I'd like to do is see if I can get a commitment for us to touch base a year from now, maybe do a follow-up podcast, and then we'll have 12 months of some data to see what some companies did, the risks that they took, the innovation that they made, and to see there's going to be some phenomenal success stories in the next 12 months. Oh, sure. absolutely. And I think, you know what, I think a lot of companies that have that innovative talent, man, they're going to come out guns blazing because they're going to look at this situation and they're going to rub their hands together and go, that big behemoth that's slow to move and might be a power player. You know, I think that that was, that was Jeff Bezos rubbing his hands at Walmart oh, going, yeah. oh, you have no idea what's right. about to hit you. And I think you know, 10 years ago, people would say nothing can beat Walmart. Walmart's the 800 pound grill in the room. And Jeff Bezos was in the corner rubbing his hands together going online. You have two clicks. You have no idea what's about to hit you. And so yeah. I would love to come back on in 12 okay. months because awesome. I think today, right now, somebody is sitting in a boardroom rubbing their hands together going, oh man, you know, COVID-19, this is our opportunity because that big guy you know, yeah. he's not even looking at this. No, I love it. Okay. So last uh, question I have, this is kind of a fun one. So make this as fun as you can with, without sharing too much, but in your, within your business now, you've touched a lot of amazing people, right? A lot of big brands, big personalities. What's your most memorable 
um, interaction with a customer that you've had that is, is kind of a fun one that you'd like to sh maybe share publicly? Yeah, there have been so, so many fun ones. I think thinking like more recently, what, what was really fun was even, I think even myself who, who knows about innovation and who knows to get out of your comfort zone, it's still hard, even for yeah. me. It's, you know, you know, you're supposed to eat the broccoli, but it doesn't mean you eat the broccoli. Right. You know, you know, you're supposed to do it, but it doesn't mean you do it. And so I will, I will never forget last year, uh, had a chance meeting with Oprah's team over breakfast and we were sitting at breakfast and I was, you know, pitching with a colleague of mine, helping him out saying, you know, we can help you with this, you know, idea a no problem. And about halfway through the meal, they said, well, what about idea B? And I said, oh, you know, like, I don't really do idea B. And they're like, but could you do idea B? I was like, well, guess I guess I could, but you know, <laughs> I've never done it. I don't know. Right. And, and they left the meeting and they emailed me and they say, no, 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 we want you to do idea B. And, and idea B, there were big, big, big players in the, in the game, like big fortune 500 companies, publicly traded stock. And I'm going, Oh my, I'm a cockroach compared to some of the players in, in idea B, you know, and I've never done it. Right. So there's that. Um, I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea. And it was, it was Oprah's team that was really telling me, we want you to do this. We know you can do this. And we ended up doing it and it was amazing and it That's was awesome. fantastic. And, you know, it, Oprah was super happy. Her team was super happy. And I think it's an important lesson, an important story. Cause I, again, I've had my company for nine years and whether it's the New York Mets or, or, you know, Bob Dylan or Kiss or Jimmy Buffett, you know, we've worked with some amazing names. And so to sit there and have someone's team, you know, Oprah's team basically convince me, right. which is crazy to, to do work for them um, was just such a poignant lesson to me in that you never know what you're capable of. And sometimes it takes other people pushing you, whether that, that person is in your organization or outside of your organization. Right. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a fun story, but it really, you know, I've been saying to people, yeah, Oprah really pushed me out of my comfort zone, which is <laughs> so funny uh, and, and kind of ironic because for someone that has worked in marketing and worked with, you know, trying to be innovative, it's sort of funny that Oprah was kind of the kick in the butt, <laughs> but it, it was a kick in the butt that I needed, I guess. No, that's a, that's a phenomenal story. That's one you'll never forget for sure. That's great. Never, never, ever. So I want to encourage the listeners to reach out to you, your company. What's the best way for all that to happen if they want to get more information? Absolutely. Well, definitely visit the superfancompany.com. We have a ton of examples, information, okay. case studies on there. It's packed full of information. So definitely check that out. Um, I think be, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is really simple. It's kim at the superfancompany.com. So not very complicated there. Uh, also on LinkedIn personally and for the company. And again, it's the super fan company. So it's pretty, awesome. pretty fun and easy to find us. Well, I'll also put that in the details of the podcast. So the listeners, if, if you're driving right now and you, you, you want to go back and you just want to get the email or web address, I'll make sure I put that in the description. So Kim, this has been a blast. I really, really have enjoyed our time together. And I can't thank you enough for, you know, with all that's going on, you giving us a little bit of time and inspiration to help, you know, really the manufacturing industry hopefully come up with some ideas of how they can successfully move forward. Thank you for having me. This was amazing. I so look forward to hearing more from you, to, li to the yes. listeners. I look forward to hearing from them. I think that we're all going to come out of this in a whole new way and, and definitely for the better. I agree. Well, be safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Kim. All right. Bye-bye.